So I was going to say when I started this, welcome to another sunny Sunday morning in the UK. But the sun's gone in, it's not sunny at the moment. Which is, okay, fair enough. Um, anyway, where are we going to start? So, I'm going to start with um, what I consider a piece of penny pinching by my friends at Roland. And that is, if you've bought a Aria recently, you would have got the instruction manual. And there is the instruction manual. Printed both sides on a piece of, what's that? That's uh, A3, A2, A1. On a piece of A1. Okay. Uh, by the way, A1 is draft in the language of size of paper. Um, but to be honest, it's uh, completely unusable in the studio because you can't put it on anything you know it's too big to go on a on a, on a, a ledge next to the piece of equipment it's it's useless it's not brilliant for somebody when you're especially when you've got a new piece of equipment so what did i do so i went on to the uh the roland website found the manual uh and it does actually come down in a pdf of a zero size just for the record I then uh, used a piece of image software to cut out the bits I wanted, like so. So there you go, there's the TB3 and the TR8 instructions. And then I uh, put them onto a, printed them double sided, and then laminated them so that they could sit in the studio. So when I'm working with a piece of equipment, I could actually have it there for a quick reference. Um, very useful in the early days, not so much use for me now that I've got my, my head around how the equipment works. But in the early days it was very, very useful. Okay, so if you haven't already done so, that's how I reckon you should get your quick reference manuals for the RE equipment sorted. Okay. Um, and on the drum machine and the MX-1, you know, you ended up with lots of different things related to the equipment okay so I've ended up with lots of laminates for quick reference anyway laminate cards uh, the next thing is and this is probably more of an annoyance than anything else anyone else uh, had problems with the global shipping program from eBay now I have to be honest to say this is not me personally I'm just relaying in the experience of a friend of mine um, so my friend's situation was very simple uh, he bought um, some stuff from the US, uh, the stuff never arrived, in fact it's got lost in, in, in tracking somewhere, nobody, nobody really seems to understand where it is. Uh, the seller, the vendor went through the, the global shipping program where they effectively, you pay the vendor the amount of money you've agreed to pay for the stuff and then there's another charge that comes out which goes to Pitney Bowes which is this global shipping program. And the whole idea of the global shipping program, which is a really sort of quite a neat idea, is that once you've agreed a price, that's the only price you have to pay. So you don't get clobbered with import duty this end and customs and everything else. It's all done, it's all pre-cleared um, at, at the other end. Um, so my friend's experience is very simple. It, his stuff never arrived. He contacted the vendor. Uh, the eBay guarantee scheme then kicks in uh, and he got his money back. That was fine. But that was from the vendor. He hasn't had his money back from, from the Global Shipping Program yet. Um, because he's got to prove that stuff never arrived. Um, which it never did because the tracking, the tracking number for the, of, of the um, equipment that he ordered is not there. You know, it's, it's sort of a bit of a weird one. So he's having problems getting that back. There's no customer services on the Global Shipping Program. It's all done by email. So, you know, you can't just ring somebody up and just have a chat. You, you know, you're having to sort of go backwards and forwards all the time. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. And he hasn't got his money back from the global shipping program, even though he's had his money back from the, um, the vendor. Um, the one thing I will say about the global shipping program, having, having sort of had a look at various things, is that I think it's a little bit expensive, if I'm honest. Um, I've done a couple of scenarios now where I bought equipment in the US um, and had it shipped back to the UK and um, it was cheaper for me to go and arrange for 
think I use UPS for UPS to go and, and pick the, the, the piece of equipment up from the vendor. Uh, so we arranged a time and place and they went and did, they went and did their stuff. Um, so they went and picked it up and then shipped it back and then I just paid the, and, and, and we pre-cleared the uh, customs charges based on the paperwork. So it worked out really easy and it worked out a lot cheaper than, a lot cheaper than trying to use the global shipping program. All right, so um, I'm not sure about this whole global shipping program. I mean, the whole idea is brilliant. You know, the, the, the concept is good. I'm just not sure that the uh, the partner that is being used is is the right partner, and whether the um, because they don't see it end to end. I mean, that's the whole thing about this is that they use. It's not like FedEx or UPS. I mean, if you do a UPS or a FedEx, you know, pretty much wherever you go in the world, there's FedEx and UPS. They have prisons. Um, whereas the global shipping program seems to use a variety of smaller carriers, probably um, uh, sort of suited to the locale. So you know, I've had a couple of things come through on the global shipping program, um, you know, just small items where they've come through through you know local carriers like Yodel or um, oh, I can't think what the other one is, but you know, the smaller carriers that are more UK based rather than more international. Um, rather than, you know, if I was buying stuff from the Far East or I was buying stuff from Australia and I was using the Global Shipping Program, i oh, sorry, not using the Global Shipping Program, I'd be using UPS or, or FedEx because of the worldwide presence that those companies have. Don't know. Um, anyway, any, if anyone else has had problems with the, with the Global Shipping Program, it would just be interesting to hear um, what your experiences are. I'm not saying I'm going to do anything with it, but just be interesting to hear um, what your, uh, what your uh, experiences are. Um, da, 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 da. So the uh, the next thing is uh, I was down in my lockup where I keep a lot of my equipment. Um, I can't have all my equipment out. I don't just don't physically have the space for it in the the location where my studio is at the moment. Um, although I'm hoping to rectify that before the end of the year because I want to move the studio somewhere else. Uh, for a number of reasons. Number one is there are not enough power sockets here, um, which is a bit annoying given my I'm quite anal about power. Uh, <laughs> um, number two is I'd like to have a few more pieces of equipment out. Um, I'd also, you know, I think you saw the, the email last, uh, the, the video last week was talking about, you know, inputs uh, onto my mixer. Um, and I think the only way I'm going to solve that is to get a bigger desk. At the moment, I don't have a space to have a desk out. Um, I just don't physically have the have the space for it. So the only place to way to do that is to move the studio. Um, anyway, well, I was down at my uh, my storage unit, and I recovered this from the storage unit. So this is a Roland PG one thousand, um, and effectively, this was produced. Uh, to help people um, edit the, the the sounds, stroke tones on a D50 or a D55. Oh, um, and I used to use it quite a lot, um, and then I put it in storage uh, when I moved a couple of times, um, and this is the first time I've really taken it out. It's a bit dusty. Um, I've just had a new cover sorted for it, which is somewhere around here. Um, so. I intend to put that out and it'll probably go on the end of the arm over there somewhere. Now, the great thing about this unit is that all the parameters on the D50 that you can alter where you have to keep clicking through screens and menus and screens and menus to do so, um, effectively you have a fader and you mop the fader up and down and you can make the adjustment. Very, very, very simple. Right? Makes editing tones on the D50 infinitely easier. Um, so, and, and it's very useful where you just want to sort of like play around with the parameters almost in real time. So I've always found that editing via the screen, you'll have to go to the screen, you have to edit it, then you have to come out of the screen, then you have to go back in it. Yeah, it, it's, whereas this is more or less, you know, you, you make the change and it's almost instant, instantly available on the keyboard. Um, so a very interesting unit. Um, all I can remember about last time I set this up, it was a real absolute bitch to set up. Um, and bearing in my, no my knowledge from that, I've had to go and buy a couple of bits that I don't now have, or I 
can't find um, to allow this to be set up properly. So we shall see what happens. I'm going to go to a video of setting this up. Um, but it is very, very useful. If you, if you want to play around with the D50 and the sounds on the D50, very, very useful. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it with a computer. Of course you can. Uh, and there are computer editors that actually mirror this. I mean, I've seen a couple of them recently. Um, but it, it means you've got to dump the sound to the computer and you've got to then dump the sound back from the computer. And, you know, I'm, I just find the whole sort of dumping, dumping tones backwards and forwards a faff. I have to be honest, I'd rather have them on the, on the keyboard themselves and do, do what I need to do, uh, and then store them off. So, there we go. That's the, the PG-1000. Now, they did make a little brother for the 1000, and they called it the 10. In fact, they've made a series of these, actually, for different keyboards um, in, the, in the various Roman ranges over the years. Um, so, this was the 10. Okay, there are, there's the 10. I have one of those as well. And that's for editing tones on a D20 or a D10, which is why it was called a 10. I'm not quite sure whether that was called a 1000, but this was called a 10. Okay, and again, for exactly the same reason, you just notice there's, there's a few parameters to be altered on this one. Very, very useful. Very, very useful for just knocking off harshness of the sound, if that's all you want to do. Okay, and again, a complete bitch to set up. So, uh, we'll see what we do with those. Um... I think that's probably about it for this uh, this segment. So uh, I'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.